And for all you listeners out there, we've got a treat today. Uh, as we've mentioned a few times on the podcast in the past, TrueSpec started a tour department not so long back. And uh, the first player we signed to TrueSpec Tour is Kevin Chapel. So we are joined today, finally, by Kevin Chapel. Kevin, thanks for coming on the pod. Yeah, thanks for having me. What does that mean, that you're signed with TrueSpec? Um... I own my name and likeness, and uh, I, get the, I, get, I get the perks of uh, all that true spec is. Nice. So, Sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah, so uh, basically, you know, working towards finding the 14 best golf clubs in the bag, brand agnostically, you know, no, mm. no, no restrictions on brand, product, uh, and, and just finding whatever's going to work best. That's what we've been working on for the last couple months. First of all, obviously, you've been kind of going through uh, some injuries. How are you feeling health-wise? Health-wise, feel great. Um, you know, I guess it's been uh, almost two years since I had back surgery. Been in back playing, competing for about a year now. Um, maybe only six months with the coronavirus, um, with that layoff. But um, I feel great. feel like my game's close. Um, obviously, I've, I've done a lot of equipment testing and have enjoyed that process. And I think that's going to help me kind of get over the – the line and uh, help kind of push me along and play some better golf here shortly. How has uh, back injury and recovery affected your swing mechanics and things you're doing fitting wise with Tim? So, uh, I mean, it's been huge. So 2000, we go back to 2016, I probably played my best golf for the longest period of time. And if we just look at flight dynamics, I was a low to mid flight guy, high spin guy. And um, about then was when my back got, started getting really bad and I was having to compensate. And again, that's when Nike got out of the business and I was a Nike athlete. And uh, I felt, so there was a lot of variables there. And the end of 16, I'm t- testing equipment. My ba- I have a back issue. And all of a sudden my delivery numbers are changing. But my delivery numbers are getting more optimum for a short period of time. So I'm hitting it higher, I'm hitting it further, whether that's from delivery numbers or equipment, cha- the, the, being able to change and test new equipment. And all of a sudden, by mid-2017, I was a top five Apex player and not spinning it as much. Mm-hmm. So my windows had changed, my shot dispersions had changed, and my shot shapes had changed, and I had new equipment. So how do you, how do you attack <laughs> that? How do you, how do you change that? And you know, I was fortunate to play some good golf in 17 as well because I think I had I was in between kind of all those patterns. Um, and, you know, that's – you often see that with swing changes is guys do – are good when they're in between the swing change right. and then they get to one extreme or the other is when they struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's uh, – you know, I played some good golf in 17, new equipment, found some distance, and then my back goes out in 18 and I decided to have surgery and, you know – we rehabbed it. We're coming back, and I'm still kind of the guy that was there in 17, 18. But we're trying to get back to the guy that was the delivery numbers and shot shapes and profiles of 16. What were some of the frustrations that went on when Nike kind of exited the equipment business and then just going through professional golf as a free agent? I guess for me, like the hardest part was who do you trust? Where do you go? Um, how do you go about testing product? For for me, it was a eight year relationship with Nike, playing their stuff and. It was a rough start for me with them. Um, you know, my rookie year, I played, I was a Bridgestone athlete, played uh, Bridgestone ball, irons, wedges. Um, so I guess there was, maybe it was 10 clubs I had, a ball and 10 club deal. And, uh, you know, I have a great finish third in the U.S. Open, have a second place finish somewhere, maybe get to the top 70 um, on the FedEx Cup. And I signed with Nike, comes knocking, I signed with Nike, changed 14 clubs. And that next year, I almost lose my card. Um, but that kind of started the momentum with Nike, and it was like, all right, like I'm here, I'm in, I'm committed. I kept my card, I have a job. Let's make this right. Let's mm-hmm. let's find some stuff. And by the time 16 was around, I or 16 came around, I really felt like I was playing the best stuff for me. And then I had the opportunity to test other things, and I probably wasn't playing the best stuff for me, but it was working. Mm-hmm. Um, so the hardest part was finding who who do you trust, who do you go to to get stuff, and and where do you start? And so what I tried to do was have one person build everything, no matter the name um, on the club, the name on the shaft. Just I wanted one person to build it so that my seven irons were being built on the same machine by the same person, so they should all spec out the same. Club companies don't like that. Titleist wants to build Titleist clubs. Callaway wants to build Callaway clubs. You know, Ping wants to build Ping clubs. And so 
Now all of a sudden you're having seven irons built by four different companies that they have the specs, but each machine's different. Each measuring stick's different. And I noticed that right away um, in the testing process. And so that's that's where the agnostic idea came to me or like I got exposed to it. It's like, man, this would be great if you could really do it, but it's really hard to do it on tour. Yeah. So is that what basically attracted you to true spec and working with Tim? Well, so living in Scottsdale, you know, knowing um, a lot of the guys that work here at 8 a.m. golf, um, you know, that that's the idealistic world would be having someone that is truly agnostic, that has a, a knowledge of every piece of product, whether it's, you know, grip weight to shaft profiles to, you know, how a scoring line affects ball flight. And, uh, you know, you can check all the boxes and have one person doing it in a safe environment and uh, and with the ultimate goal of finding the 14 best clubs for you. And, and as soon as I kind of realized that TrueSpec could do that, it was like, I'd, you know, I went up the, the chain at um, 8 a.m. golf and, and TrueSpec and said, hey, I'm interested. What do you guys think? And they, uh, they jumped on board. Do you think this is kind of like the way of the future for contracts on tour? Because you were once locked in basically a 14 club contract. Like, how does that compare to brand agnostic? And have guys been like asking you about it? Like, hey, what's it like over there? I've definitely had a lot of questions about it. And um, guys are intrigued at the idea. Our purses aren't going down. We're in a pandemic right now. We're still playing for the same amount of money we were. And I think it's going to go up. So guys are seeing, man, we're playing for a lot of money. And why wouldn't I play the 14 best clubs for me? Mm-hmm. You know, I can make way more money for for ninety nine percent of us that play professional golf. We can make way more money on the golf course than we can off the golf course. Mm-hmm. There's that one percent, or that which is let's call it 10, 15 guys that they can make more money off the golf course. But for ninety nine percent of us, you you gotta you gotta have your tools sharpened and, and ready to go because that's how you're gonna make your living. So, uh, what's been like the testing process with Tim? Have you? Have you gone through like every brand of clubs through the bag, all drivers, all irons? So Hoyt McGarity here, 8 a.m. golf, that was his challenge to me when we started this process was, can you go into this with a completely open mind, like impartial to everything? And at first I was like, well, I'm not going to change iron shafts. I'll test every head and everything, but I'm going to check, I'm going to test one iron shaft. And he's like, well, that's kind of against what we do, you know, but if that's what you want to do, well... Do it. We'll and, work around it. Yeah, we'll work around it. And I went home and slept on it. And I remember texting Hoyt. I'm like, all right, I'm in. Like, let's, if you think there's an iron shaft that's better, you know, let's do it. And uh, so, yeah, we've tested everything. And I think actually the, the pandemic was a blessing for us. And yeah. because we were able to spend a lot of time together. And so we did, I've guesstimated that it was probably 10 two hour sessions. Yeah, so we spent about, about 20 hours 20, of work. 20 hours of work. Uh, 10 two hour sessions? About 20 hours of work spread out over about six weeks. And, you know, one of the big things is, You'd never had an opportunity to actually check all the boxes as it came to equipment and hit every product from every brand, whether it was shafts or heads, and the combinations and iterations thereof, right? And so one of the things I think that's very important when you're baselining with anybody you're starting to work with at Kevin's level, let's check all the boxes. Even if it's something that I don't think is really going to work that well or something that maybe he's not 100% fond of a look or a feel, let's hit it once just to hit it and check the box. And I think as the process evolves, it becomes a lot more expedited because now I know the preferences. Now I know the things that work and what don't work. So if we have to make a change or we are thinking of making a change, it's easy to go right to something that's going to be an option. Mm -hmm. But that first initial part of the process, the pandemic was absolutely a blessing in disguise because it gave us two and a half months of runway to actually work through this Mm -hmm. Um, and, and get to a solution that coming out of the pandemic... We had 14 clubs that the we clubs, had tested. and Yeah, that were tested, that he that he had confidence in, that you know that, that he knew what we're going to, how they were going to play on the golf course. Before we get into what actually is in the bag, I got to ask the question that fully equipped listeners really want to know. From your experience, how good of a fitter is Timmy B? Oh. The professor. I call him Timmy B. He's the professor. Well, so what I was most impressed with was I would test something and he would know why it didn't work. And then he would know how to or what to take out of the test pile because it was similar to what didn't work. And so that that was huge for me because it saved me having to test another piece of product. I mean, 10 two-hour sessions, we saw how you were like, wow, that's a lot of work. But yeah. 
we probably if we literally tested everything that and didn't limit it would, it would have been a lot longer and so that's what was most impressive was his knowledge of everything whether it was a head a shaft um he was able to kind of eliminate things before i could hit him because it was similar to something else i didn't like or he could right. say hey these are the four you're going to like because you really like that one and it tested the best so let's just let's put our focus here mm-hmm. um because of i mean he he would talk to me about shaft diameter and kick points and i'm like dude this you're speaking spanish to me just <laughs> i like the look of this and i like the, with the flight it produced let's i want more of that <laughs> but i would say this that his feels are all tour players and everybody knows this that that when you do this for a living that your feel of a golf club is very unique and it's very it's very um what's the word i'm looking for you can sense a lot of different things that the average person can't so all tour players to some degree have this this innate sense of picking up a golf club and what it feels like to them and looks like for that matter i'd say that on the spectrum kevin's way up there in the charts as far as his feel i mean the really interesting thing about Kevin and a lot of really good ball strikers, I'd say that you know, ball striking wise throughout his career, it's always been one of his, of the things that he's done very well, is that they will make a golf club work. Now he'll do it by destroying good mechanics. You know, his ego is not going to let him hit a golf club like crap. Yeah. So he sees a flight that's not right, or he looks down specifically, looks down at the face of the club and it doesn't sit the way he likes it to look, he's going to make a different mechanical move so that it delivers the right way to make the shot fly straight. The average golfer can't do that. The average golfer, if it looks a funny way at, at address, they can't really, they don't have the ability to change it dynamically at, at impact. With him, he is. And that's the thing you got to be super careful of, is that you give him a product that he makes work, but what he's doing to make work actually takes him away from what he wants to do from a mechanical standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, we talk about those 10 two hour sessions. I, we probably could have done it faster if the human element wasn't involved, right? <laughs> so if I truly delivered the club the same way every day, yeah. we probably could have eliminated things faster. But um, obviously, I'm a human and I'm going to make bad swings. And there were a couple of days we yeah. rolled out there where the delivery pattern yeah. was a little different than it was, you know, in the optimal world yeah, and where but he wants. I, and what happens those days? Well, like, that's important because he's going to have those days on the golf course too. <clears throat> mm. So you, you want something that's going to work when it's not ideal and and really work when it's ideal right and mm-hmm. um, i guess in a perfect world you we would have an iron you know true spec would have an iron byron and that's how you would get fit mm-hmm. here yeah. this guy swings at 108 miles an hour and he's three down and three yeah. to the right here you go this is yeah. the stuff you should play because it tests the best but that's just not what we do you know every yeah. as much as we try to make it the same every day we're not and and so the shaft's going to kick a little differently the club path's going to be a little different which is going to produce different ball flight and you just want to make sure that when that's happening, the ball's staying in play, the ball's going in the direction you want it to go in, and it's manageable, and uh, and then you can, you know, that's the art of golf. You can go play the game and shoot the lowest score you can. So when you're on a session, a fitting session with him, what's that process look like? Are you just, like, rifling through heads on, and shafts and trying stuff? It all depends on what we're targeting. So, like, today we're going to spend some time after the interview. We're going to look at some drivers. Specifically, we're going to look at driver heads. Uh, I think as we've worked through this process, we've got a pretty good set of clubs in there right now. The one thing that has been more challenged than the other parts of the game for Kevin lately has been driving. And so we at first said, well, maybe it's the shaft part. And the reason being that he's delivering the golf club a little differently now than when we started this process four or five months back. Um, and he's making a golf swing that's more representative of what he made when he was playing his best golf pre-injury. So the pattern is migrating back to where it was pre-injury, and that's why you're seeing flashes of really good golf, which is why he's really excited because he's seeing some of the stuff he saw pre-injury, and he's like, man, I'm really close. But the driver's getting a little loose. All the other clubs in the bag I think are pretty good, but the driver we got to do some work on. Today what we're going to work on is we're just going to look at club heads. So we've got uh, four different club heads we're going to test. What are they? The, the exact same. I'm not going to get into that. Come on right now. now. But we're going to test four <laughs> different club heads, and they're all the exact same loft. They're all the exact same lie angle. Uh, one of the things about Kevin is we don't like to use a lot of adjustability in those loft sleeves. Some tour players, we can do it. As you know, like with Tiger, Tiger didn't even know how to use a loft sleeve when mm-hmm. he first started working with TaylorMade. He's like, what the yeah. hell is this thing? Um, 
But other players, you don't want to use them at all. And the reason we don't use them with Kevin really all that much is because if he sees a face that he doesn't like at a dress, he's going to fix it. Mm -hmm. So he negates the loft sleeve just by fixing it innately through what he wants to do. So we play most everything pretty standard as far as loft, just so he's not tempted to try to fix it and lean back. If he doesn't yeah, so see my loft. tendency would be less loft. I go up and right, mm. more loft down and left, and just try to. I'm trying to counteract what I'm seeing. If you blindfolded me, it would probably be a better yeah. way to do it. But <laughs> yeah, but he's reacting all the time, and that's you know when we talk about robotic testing versus player testing, this is the big argument. You know when you have a player like Kevin who's adjusting based upon what they see. The robot obviously doesn't make those adjustments. So which one is more realistic to the real world? Well, in Kevin's case, robotic testing doesn't matter as much because he's fixing it the way it feels throughout the swing and at a dress. So are you more chasing like a look and a feel that you want? Or are you like looking at ball speed numbers and you're like, I want the highest number and then let's, let's the figure above. it out. Yeah, I, think, I guess for me, I, I'm, look, I'm chasing a ball flight. Mm -hmm. And then in an ideal world, that ball flight – the club that whatever club produces that ball flight looks the best to me on the ground mm -hmm. and then would feel the best in my hand. Um, you know, I've tended to play stiffer parts that were stiffer in the tip and what t tested the best, um, you know, during the pandemic was a shaft that wasn't stiff in the tip, yeah. right? It was stiff it was, in the handle. It was, it was a very different profile than what he had been using. But it flat out tested the best. And, and it worked well the first couple times he used it. But the pattern started to shift. As I, that, I guess that's one thing we've left out is M Mark Blackburn was probably the third yeah. person that was really involved in this. And we had an open line of communication between the three of us. Of Mark had to tell Tim what we're working on. So Tim could say, okay, uh, this, is, Mark is, this is what I can expect um, from Kevin golf swing wise. This is why this part's not going to work and this part's not going to work. But these two parts would work. So yeah. let's, let's put our focus here. And Mark, tell me when he's got it, and yeah. then we can really go down, you know, mm -hmm. into dig into the, this profile of parts because he's there. Yeah. And uh, and so Mark's been a big, big piece of that. So it's been a collaboration, and but for I'd say, I want to produce a ball flight, and then ball flight looks feel would be the order of, of priority for me. Is it like not even worth having a fitting session while you're like really fresh off a swing change? And you're like just working through it the whole the, time. You know, if you're paying for the fitting, um, I would say you're probably, it depends upon where you are in that process. If you're right at the beginning of the process and, and you're a younger person who's athletically inclined that can actually make some changes, then I would say you may want to hold off a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about Kevin changing his mechanics, in three months it was significant. You know, I saw some video comparing it to the video, you know, three months, four months ago when we started this work. And he and Mark are working on something that's causing the club to exit much flatter and more left. And when you look at the video, the club's exiting kind of out of the left bicep when you look down the frame. Three months ago, it was exiting out of the left shoulder. So that, that finish is much more left and flat. So what does that tell you? Is that like a lie angle thing you're going to be looking at? It could be a lie angle thing. It definitely could be a shaft thing. And as it turns out, it kind of was a little bit of a shaft thing. Mm -hmm. Because the way he's loading the shaft specifically through impact and the way he's applying force to the shaft had changed. And before, he was kind of dragging the handle through the impact area. And now he's not dragging it as much. And the, the handle's moving more radially because he's turning a hell of a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so that's putting force on the shaft in a completely different way. The part that we had been using was really soft in the handle, which was great at the time because he wasn't exactly putting a ton of shaft or force in the shaft. Mm -hmm. He was dragging it this way instead of turning it this way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now all of a sudden he's turning it this way a little bit more. Well, that part's not going to work. Right. So that's kind of the transition we're in right now is matching up the driver part to the rest of the gear, but also making sure that it syncs up with the three wood because the three wood's been pretty good. And there's been one part in the bag that's been kind of a tough part, which is 240, 245. I think we've got a good option there now, but that, you know, a six wood or a five wood, something in that range, finding something that he has 100% ownership in that gives him that nice high ball flight. You know, Kevin hits it pretty flat and launch angles are pretty typical with lower spins because he hits it so squarely with the proper shaft lane. 
so it doesn't take off with a ton of spin. Must be nice. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but that was the challenge we had initially starting out was underspun. Totally. And, and, you know, iron shots that were not spinning enough. And that leads into the iron shaft change, yep. right? So, so you did make an iron shaft change. We, despite what I wanted, I did make an iron shaft change. And, and it's been great. It's helped. We've found spin and brought in dispersion. So, I mean, yeah. can't complain about that. You wouldn't have made that change if you didn't come in with an open mind. Correct. <clears throat> well, you almost didn't. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I so, had to talk him into it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I say I think overall. And then the one question that I think is really intriguing is, Kevin's putter. We haven't really changed very much. And as you know, I'm a, I'm a huge putter guy. Yep. And it was really good. And so You're also a fan good? of not changing putters too much, though. Give him a chance, riding them out. Give him a chance to work. Like, we made a grip and a spec change. Yep. That's it. Um, but my curiosity is, that's a really unique putter. So, okay, so kind of a long story, but and it kind of goes along my whole career. But so in 2000, my rookie year... I was, I could play whatever putter I wanted. Have a great relationship with Paul Vazanko, Scotty Cameron. He's a UCLA Bruin, so I've known him since I was at school there. And so I got to spend a lot of time with Paul. And and so he would, I'd go spend, you know, two days a year, or, or make two visits to the studio a year, and we'd work on mechanics and trying to find kind of a similar thing. You know, we're trying to find a putter that supports the mechanics or supports what we're trying to do with the stroke. And uh, the Circus sixty. Two? Is that what it was? Mm-hmm. So the Circus 62 line was hot at the time, and they're, they're kind of B60 style. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I don't know the, the name, but yeah. uh, the B60 style head was something that caught my eye. So I was using that. Had you ever used a Ping B60 before I had that? never used a Ping B60 before that. But that so it's that butterfly-shaped trailing edge. It's what I have in the bag right now. Do so. you really? You play, <laughs> yeah, you play a B60? I got the old Ping V60, yeah, from like Super 30 years ago. Putter. That's yeah. the reason I asked. Like a Scotty Cameron Circle T B60 style putter with a two with a two point five hosel with a two point five hosel mid, almost mid face weld. Uh, nobody else has this. I went from answer style to the B60. And it's like my alignment's better. I'm stroking it better. I'm hitting in the center of the face better. So there it's you like... go. So the alignment better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we yeah. were, so back to Paul, working with Paul and I was using that B60 style putter with a heel shaft, two, 2.5 hosel um, in the heel. And we were noticing, I didn't line it up in the middle of the face and there was a lot of shaft, of head swing. And so at the time, um, maybe they had just done a Ruji Yamada inspired putter or recently, and there was one in this case. And he's like, here, try this. And so it's his is, I think, is center shafted. And it's not, it has a similar shape to the, the butterfly, but not, it's not completely butterfly. Right. And so he hands it to me. I line it up right in the middle, line it up dead square at the hole, hit it, goes in. And I'm like, sweet, do it again, goes in, sweet. Uh, can I have this one? Uh, they laugh at me. They're like, no, nope, that's, <laughs> that's the only head we have. And I was, he's like, but what we can do is the putter you've been using, we can relocate the hosel, uh, re- yeah, relocate the shaft, and uh, let's see if that works. So this would have been, you know, late summer and play through the fall, um, and I get the putter. Well, about that same time was when a, a Nike contract came mm. and, and was put in front of me. And so I actually never got to use the putter. Because I hmm. signed with Nike, 14 club deal. I was excited. I jumped right in. So during the pandemic, well, my wife's looking at me like, what are you going to do with that garage? You got all the time in the world. <laughs> like, all right, I'll go clean it up. So cleaning out the garage, getting things organized. I'm like, what's in this bag? Reach down the bottom. Here's this putter. And I'm like, man, this thing's awesome. What, why didn't I ever use this? So I started playing a lot of golf. I had a standard game. I played um, Tuesdays and Saturdays with Chez. Revy and Derek Anderson, and we'd have a good time. And I'm just like, ah, oh, we're just having fun playing for a few bucks. Why don't I take this out there? So I start making some putts with it. Sure enough, Tim and I start this process, and we, you watch me hit some putts at TPC, and you're like, man, I think you're aiming it pretty good. And so we brought it into the lab here, and and aim was great. Yeah. Um, so he's like, listen, I, l- you aim it great. You like the look of it. Can we test grip? So let's just, let's just let's test one variable. So we tested some different grips yeah. and that was eye opening to me that, that how a different grip I'm gripping it. What I feel is the same way, but there's just a different style of grip on there and how that affects roll. And so we found one that maybe didn't have the most forward roll, right. forward spin, but it had the most consistent. consistent. Um, and, and that's uh, a huge thing in putter fitting. Mm-hmm. 
there's only one metric that has to be zero and that's face angle at impact. Everything else is kind of a preference, but if the deviation is super tight, you'll be all right. So you look at tour players that deliver a putter awkwardly or uniquely, Billy Mayfair, with a shorter putter, right? With a shorter putter, Billy Mayfair is across it. I don't know mm -hmm. how much, man. But he does it the same way every time. Stricker stands it up on the toe, which yeah. impacts, that impacts his strike point on the face. But if you look at his putter, you see a spot worn out on the face because it's the same thing every time. So in his case, like, it wasn't about finding an optimal spin rate off the face. It was about... Can we make it the same every time you hit the same length putt? Because if you can, that means speed control is going to be pretty good. So now we only have one variable mm -hmm. on why I missed the putt. Yeah, exactly. How was your read? How was your read? You know, his, his start lines and his aims are good, so he's hitting it where he sees it. He's able to replicate the same speed off the face by changing the grip a little bit. How does that play in? Why is changing the grip change the way the ball rolls? Um, it changes a lot of things that impact. It, it, it changes how fast the ball takes off off the face. That's due to grip pressure. When you have a smaller grip, you tend to grip it a little more firmly. Bigger grips, you grip more loosely. So the ball takes off from a larger style grip a little softer than it does on a smaller style grip. Kind of interesting. So. Very interesting. It was fascinating. So, I, the, what, what's the grip that Henrik uses? The Garson. The Garson, yeah, Garson yeah, Max. Garson. It has the ridge down the top where and you. Yep. Put your arms like kind of almost against the yeah. rib cage. It gets your thumbs like under. We w yeah. we would see like a thousand RPMs of forward spin with that putter. Yeah. But then we'd crazy. see zero. So then the the deviation was deviation a thousand was a thousand yeah. RPM. That's not what you want. So, but it was, it was like, wow. I want that overspin every time, mm -hmm. wow. but I need it every time. Yeah. And right. then the, I think we settled on a two point oh super stroke. Yeah. Or not settled, but that was, and that was, it, that was, that was deviation was deviation fifteen was RPMs tight. and. And He'd been working a little of, bit with Phil Kenyon and kind of just passed it by. Once again, uh, to all the listeners out there, if you're taking lessons and you're considering getting fit, get your pro involved because it's really going to help the process. If I didn't have an open line uh, side note, Mark Blackburn, who teaches Kevin and I worked together for a couple of years back when I was with TaylorMade. He's been with Titleist forever, but we worked at the same facility back in Alabama together. So there's a familiarity there mm -hmm. and an open line of communication. And, you know, there are very many times throughout the week where Kevin doesn't even realize he and I are coordinating and communicating and we are. Um, and now that his caddy's involved, his caddy's now kind of part of the process. He's another set of eyes. One of the issues is, and I think Kevin will, will speak to this, the echo chamber gets really loud out on the PGA tour with people <laughs> suggesting things whether it be an equipment rep, whether it be a caddy of a friend or like, you got to tune it all. This player that found 20 yards going to this combination, so let's all go to that combination. How do you deal with that, though? Like when a certain shaft gets hot or a certain putter is racking up a lot of wins, like do you kind of feel like, okay, Tim, let's try this? Or I think a little bit. I mean, you, you – I think – as tour players, we all want to get better, right? And the goal is to play the best golf you can. And so you can't help but see what other guys are doing and, and think, hey, what if that could help me? But so having a guy on your team like Tim who, like, if I said, Tim, let's go. I want to try 48-inch driver you know, shafts. <laughs> he'd be like, well, that's not going to support what you're doing in your golf swing. We might r run into some right. other headaches there. And he can talk me off the ledge or say, all right, let's go. I, got, mm -hmm. I think this is, might be a good idea. Yeah. And so for your normal tour player that is – let's say non agnostic, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to let the parrot sit on your shoulder of it. That is the equipment rep and say, oh, here, my, th mine's better because of this. Mine's better because of this. And you could have 15 guys sitting there watching you hit drivers. And they're all going to tell you that then the, the last one wasn't good because of X, Y, and Z. Because and that that theirs is better. Was, yeah, theirs tough. is better because of X, Y, and Z. And it's just that if, if you're not mentally tough, um, you could go down that rabbit hole. And I think one of the most important words to learn when you're a tour player is no. Yeah. And, or not right now mm -hmm. because you could get overwhelmed and, you know, the ultimate goal is to win the golf tournament. So are you, are you giving yourself the best chance to win by testing driver shafts every week or testing the latest and greatest head, you know, every week? Cause you can do that. You can test something new every week on yeah. tour and it'll be pretty good. And, but is that going to help you win that week? I, I would argue no. Mm -hmm. well, I'm curious kind of where you guys are at with uh, golf ball testing. I haven't touched the golf ball. Yeah, we haven't. You um, haven't touched the golf ball? I haven't touched the golf ball. I'm fortunate I have a 
I guess that's one area that I'm not agnostic. I got yeah. being paid by Tyler's to play a golf ball. Okay. Um, but you can switch within the Tyler family. Yeah, and they have and they have a wide multitude of products between Left Dash, the new product, yeah, yeah, older products they've had in the past. As we as we've covered on the on the pod, he plays Left Dash, and mm-hmm. we haven't really messed around with it for one major reason. Kevin's a really good wedge player, um, better than most out on the PGA Tour, and you know, thank God you're a good wedge player with the driving lately. <laughs> <laughs> Shots I gotta fired. say it. I gotta say it. <laughs> Let's go. But it's been great because we we found a wedge shaft, you know, in in his wedge setup that's been great, and and haven't really changed much in the wedges because he's been such a good wedge player historically. Um, and really big thing for him is making sure that the grind is the same because he goes through a set of wedge heads every six weeks. Some guys cycle through them faster. Some guys, you know, take more time. Six weeks is pretty standard for most guys that are competing. Uh, but to be able to make sure that that grind that's on, in his case, the 62, is exactly the same, he will notice if that grind radius is off by one degree or a half degree or if it's off by two millimeters. Which is always amazing to me because, like, I can't even really He'll tell. notice it on the first <laughs> shot. He'll lay the face open, hit a shot, and he'll go. So mm-hmm. he can see instantly. You can hear it. He mm-hmm. can hear it. He can see it. And so, well, like, you can hear it because yeah. I'm I'm missing it on the face, like little on toe, little on the heel. But, He's but hitting it center every the time. The point is, and, and and this is something that I think the average listener out there would feel interesting, feel is interesting, for really good wedge players, tour caliber wedge players, reading the lie of the golf shot, hmm. and then determining exactly the way you're going to strike it based upon the lie. Nobody ever talks about this. Is that just completely feel to you? Yeah, so that, so I mean, I guess it's experience and feel, but mm-hmm. so I read the lie, which then tells me the acoustics I'm going to hear if I do it properly. Mm. So, you know, you're going to get more of a bassy sound the more open the face is. More square face is going to be more more sharp, more 100%. Go, go through the grass. Next so, you haven't been out with us in a session, but how often do we talk about sound? Sound yeah, a lot. And so that's, mm-hmm. so that's what you're going with. I mean, so... When the grind's off on a wedge, you almost hear two hits. It'd be yeah. click, click. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no. You hear, a we ground, you hear the ground, ground and then you the hear ball. the ball. It, That's not what you want to no hear. No click, click. The bass comes from hitting the ground. The, 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 treble, the, the high sound, the high pitch sound comes from hitting the ball. And so there's a sequence of the way that that pattern should sound together that when you hear it, you know it's right. And when you don't hear it, you know it's wrong. But, so you haven't had Mike how Taylor important? on here, right? No. You haven't had Mike Taylor on yet? Wait, you no. guys you uh, guys have, I think, a Jonathan, while back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but uh, so he's yeah, the he's king back, of though. acoustics. Yeah. But I remember back when I was with Nike, he put his head, like the first time I met him, he's, he has his head th- two feet from the ball, and he's, yeah. listen, he's like, nope, wrong sound. And I'm like, you know who else what does is that? this crazy old man doing? <laughs> you know who else does that? Same exact way, and I got a feeling that maybe one may have learned or collaborated <laughs> with the other, Katsuhiro Mira. Mm-hmm. So when Katsuhira, uh, Mr. Mira, Mira-san, when he fits a set of golf clubs, he doesn't even look at the ball flight. He crouches down, squats right next to the ball, impact, doesn't even look at the ball, looks at the ground away from the ball, and just, I mean, he might as well have his eyes closed. Incredible. And just listens for sound. And when he hears the right sound, he knows the soul geometry is right. So as you guys are going through all the different brands throughout the bag, is sound like very important to you? Yeah, because so sounds important because that's a form of feel, right? And so we, we put that I put that on third of my priority list earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that that is a, definitely a factor, probably more so in the driver than yeah. than the irons. Um, but I don't like a loud driver. I want no. I like the more traditional persimmon sound, um, and the the metal tingy sound is mm-hmm. not appealing to me. I know you guys were talking about the fairway wood earlier. Fairway wood is traditionally like the hardest club to get out of a bag, especially if you're playing one from like 2014 or something like that. What have you guys seen with the uh, fairway wood testing? Where are you guys at right now? Uh, so we got a TS uh, TS product from Titleist in play with a Ventus shaft in the three wood, and it's been good. It's been really good. Thank good. It's thank God it's been good. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of been what I go to. But we where we've we've struggled. So there, I have a gap between um, four iron and three wood, and. Depending on the week, I'll play a driving iron or um, a five, six wood, um, depending on what you want it, want for that golf course that week. Mm-hmm. And we've really struggled finding that six wood to yeah. to get in play. And um, I think we're getting closer, but um, we've messed with Cobra. We've messed with Titleist. Yeah. 
Um, um, and we've actually, right now I'm playing a hybrid. I've yeah. never been a hybrid guy. And a tailor-made hybrid um, has just... I'm not a hybrid guy either. So I've been, so this is kind of a thing every week on the pod where I give him grief over never even trying to hit a hybrid because he said, I'm never going to hit one. I'm like, I'm going to put you in a hybrid eventually in your set. I'll tell you what, I was j- just as stubborn as you were. And he hands it to me. He's like, I think this will be all right. And first one was like a low cut. I'm like... Hold on, hybrids don't go low and cut. Like, hold on, let's do it again. That's what comes, I'm saying. So it comes out the same window and, and does it again. And he's like, all right, go the other way. High draw. High draw. I'm like, oh, wow, this seems pretty good. Yeah, it's <laughs> some max. So we've seen this in time and time again with a lot of players. You but know. the weird thing is it's we've gone from 18 degrees of loft to this is a yeah, four. A four, so it's 21, 20, 21 degrees 21 of loft, degrees. all to hit the same window. Yeah. We're trying to get the ball to go 240, 245 in the mm-hmm. air and – and be able to go low and be able to go high. I mean, we're, we're looking for a unicorn, but... <laughs> we're close. We're, we're close. Yeah, we're getting there. Uh, one thing you mentioned earlier, 14 club deal. I got to ask. Because Andrew actually, he, he said this before we started recording, and I got to ask the question. How many guys that are on 14 club deals do you feel confident in all 14 clubs in their set? Or how many do you think are thinking there's something else out there that's better? I think if you had a gun to the head of players that are in 14 club deals and you ask them, are you playing the 14 best clubs to you or for you? I don't think any of them can honestly answer that. Yes. None of them are I, happy in 14 club deals. I, I don't. There's some, there's one club, club out that, there of the, of the 14. There's one club. They're like, man, or okay. Mm-hmm. Let, let's reword it. If we take the 20 guys on tour that are in 14 club deals or whatever it is, and we let them go through the true spec process. Do they end up with the same clubs in their bag? I don't think it would be possible. I mean, right? No, they wouldn't end up with 14 tailor-made clubs. Tailor-made makes incredible equipment, yeah. incredible people there. Mm-hmm. But they don't, you don't end up with 14 tailor-made clubs. I, I'm just, you do not, it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. companies have specialties. I mean, as yeah. much as... And the other part of it, too, is, is their design preferences. So some companies are maybe chasing a little more distance. Some may chasing a little more with you know forgiveness and consistency and then the fitting staff at these companies mirrors the philosophy of the company so if you go to company a that's really more dedicated towards consistency the fitters are going to stress more consistency when they're talking about products with players Mm -hmm. when they they they're testing products and they see product a b and c the product that's the most consistent is the one they're going to kind of push because that is in line with the company's philosophy does that make sense yep and you go over to this company where it's just more of a distance company and their guys are going to try to influence the player a little more towards the distance part of the scale. Uh, so that's a, a big part of this too is that the all the fitters out on tour are amazing. You know, They're all the best at what they do in the business. Number one, they're working with a limited toolbox. That's the most fun for me. Because they're beholden to one brand, you're saying. That's so why. The, the most fun for me is the fact that I've got this player that's in the uh, – really really elite skilled player as far as delivering the golf club to the ball and so when i have this toolbox that's every single tool in the marketplace i can start moving the needle with performance more than i can with any other type of player i work with Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah and when you are a fitter that only has access to two or three different types of club heads as opposed to 20 you know that it limits you it limits where you can go and what you can do and you have to start relying on specific builds, you know, build stuff to alter the club to get it to work as opposed to just using the club. I mean, the only adjustments we made to his irons were a little leading edge radius on the Wilsons because of turf interaction. He mm-hmm. wanted to feel a little bit less turf interaction. So um, really cool stuff. I'm assuming you're playing the Wilson staff blades. Do you play the blades through the bag or do you have a so mixed set? I play the blades <laughs> wedged There's through. a backstory to this because you the, guys are laughing, so I, I need the, to hear why. I play laughing. the Wilson staff blades wedged through five iron. Mm-hmm. And then my four iron is a Nike VR Pro combo. Okay, you still is, got that one in. That is um, rusted. It was a satin finish that is now rusted. So that came from a first conversation we had, which was, what was your favorite set of irons? To which he said... Nike VR combo, mm-hmm. which I say, okay, bring them in. A lot of people down. would agree with that too. So that was our first iron. session Classic. was bring what you're currently playing and what you what, loved. what you've loved mm-hmm. in the past. So we went and hit him and he got all the baselines for everything. And uh, that foreign made it through all 20 sessions as the best piece of equipment. 
Yeah. Um, How hard we, did you work to get that club out of the bag? So hard. <laughs> Trust me, I didn't want to see a seven-year-old or eight-year-old four iron in play. Um, but, you know, it's it's stayed in there. We're still working at trying to figure out a solution to get that out, and we'll be working on that a little bit over the next few weeks. But, uh, you know, it's 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 been fun over the these – and, and it's been fun to work with, you know, a player that truly did have an open mind because most folks can't approach it from an open mind, as Kevin mentioned, when they've been out on tour for 12, 13 years. You know, the, the echo chamber gets loud. They have preferences because they have years that they played well and they kind of look back at that equipment and they mm-hmm. start to develop preferences around stuff like that. But he's kept a really open mind through the process, which has been really helpful. Yeah. Um, and once we get this driver figured out, we should be good for a little while. I feel like that theme comes up a lot for us is have an open mind when you go into equipment testing. Yeah, because you never know. I do want to ask uh, one more question. I was at the Greenbrier when you shot 59, and the story was exploding that you basically ran out of new golf balls to switch oh, wow, to. This is amazing. Can, can you talk about that, uh, so, that little superstition you have? I, so I, this is going to sound bad, but I find golf quite boring. <laughs> okay. And, and, <laughs> I, I mean, I love what I do, and I wouldn't want to do anything else, but I just I can get bored out there. Mm-hmm. So every time I make a birdie, I change balls, and it's something exciting. Like, like I get to I get a new ball. Like it's a new a little, toy. It's the little boy in me, right? A new toy. Okay. And so I started it years ago, and you know, I throw my ball to my caddy and make a birdie. He throws me a new one. It's like, oh, game of catch, and I get a new ball. All right, here we go. And uh, so I I have only I've only carry. 12 balls because I've never made more than 12, bir- 12 birdies or 11 birdies in Eagle in a round. Yeah. So I've never made more than that. So at the Greenbrier, I'm on the 16th hole or my 16th hole, the 7th hole. I make a birdie for my 11th birdie of the day, but we started with – I started with a ball and maybe I took it out of play after the first hole or something. Mm-hmm. So I've now gone through 12 balls. And so we had to recycle one. And, uh, Were you like bugging out when you had to? No, I mean it? I'm like, oh well, I guess this is, I mean this is a good problem to be to, to have, and but we picked the wrong one, obviously. Do you have any gear superstitions? No. Is there any weird superstitions you've noticed that like other PGA Tour players have, where it's like, whoa, this guy's out of his mind? <laughs> <laughs> um, we won't mention names. We can just no. Mention I mean, I think, yeah, that's I think fine. everyone's got a lucky coin, or or yeah. they mark it, you know, differently. Like, yeah. I mean you. Like I'll mark, I always mark it heads up, and then when I move my coin, I change Tail. it to tails. Yes. So when I look down, I'm like, "Oh, my ball's been moved." Move it. That's um, really smart to do, by the way, for anyone listening. Who's I don't like think that's an original that. thought to me. I think I stole that from someone. So yeah, don't don't credit me. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I'm trying to think of any crazy superstitions. Um, I don't think there's anyone that has to flip the light switch two or three times <laughs> before they, in the locker room before they go out or anything like that. All right, so I've I've got to get into it. Do it. So, throughout my career, especially when I competed, I used to get pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> and I would, I would snap clubs. Yeah. And so I got to hear it. Your best club snapping, clubs throwing, mm. club that it has to, I don't care if you throw it in a lake, best, I, I, this club has to leave my possession. <laughs> I, got a, you I got a few good ones. <laughs> All right, so 2018, we're at um, we're in the playoffs playing the Northern Trust, and I'm going to miss a cut. And <laughs> there's four holes left, and I'm clearly going to miss a cut. And I'm frustrated. I hit a driver on a hole that I shouldn't hit driver on, and I'm but it worked out. Like I'm in the fairway, and it's like, I mean, it's a the pin is on the bottom of this ridge, and there's a you know 30 percent slope on this ridge left, and all I got to do is hit this wedge left of the hole. And it's going to hit this ridge and it spins down to the flag. Yeah. I mean, it's like I, so my, easy my kid could do, do it, it. <laughs> right? So, and there's a tree that's kind of overhanging. I'm in the fairway, but there's a tree that's overhanging on the flag line. So now it's like, it's a perfect picture that's painting f- yeah. for you. Just hit it left of the tree into that slope within a 10-yard area and the yeah. ball is going to get close to the hole. All right. You could throw it up yeah. there. All right, go. So I hit this <laughs> shot. I hit this shot and it takes off on the flag. Luckily, it launched low. So it goes under, goes under the yeah. tree. Lands next to the flag and spins right out of the hole. And it's like 15 feet. And I'm like, I tell my caddy, I'm like, that makes me so angry that I couldn't do that. That's it. I'm going to I'm gonna break a club every shot coming in. And he's like, <laughs> no he kind of like, like laughs at me. Like, oh, okay. And uh, so we get to the next tee. 
and it's a part short part three and uh i'm playing with hideki matsuyama and so hideki ha- travels with quite the crew the, yeah, entourage. Um, mm-hmm. the entourage and media follows him so he hits first and he hits it up there on the green it's a good shot and they clap so i hit one and it's a, a middle right pin and i hit it middle left as if i have a six shot lead like uh, protecting <laughs> something and it's a you know, 150 yard shot and i go to do it and i look and there's a camera on me and, I, and i'm like oh so i balk and i can put it in the bag and caddy's like what happened there and i'm like, <laughs> I'm like look the camera's on and it's still on and he's like laughing like I told you you wouldn't do it so now like we still have three holes to play or two holes to play and so we do it and i don't we play and I don't break anything and we get in. And so now I'm like, well, my word means something. So I start trying to break them, but I'm not mad anymore. Like, I'm just like <laughs> you're just going through the motions. So I'm, going of- through the motions and I keep, so I'm struggling to break some of these clubs. Cause I'm not even angry and I'm break, trying to break them over my knee. <laughs> and so finally I get frustrated and I like, don't break three of them. And I leave them in the trash can. Come to find out later, Matt Kuchar saw them in the trash can. And he finished the deal for me. He broke the other three. No way. <laughs> and he, he That's great. <laughs> and, and I'm sure you heard about it for a while. <laughs> yep. Because Kuch, he doesn't let stuff like that. He doesn't so, let stuff so that's, like that. So that's my best club breaking story. Um, that's a classic. Me. There's no. <laughs> that's good. I had a good one from college. I had this Cleveland VAS one iron, and I used to hit this thing amazing. And we were playing, I think it was University of Florida's tournament, and I hooked the thing on the last hole, cost the team the team championship, was that guy. Get out to the van, <laughs> break it over my knee, mm-hmm. and I gashed, here's the scar. <laughs> no way, still and got I a scar. Gashed, I gashed myself in the knee with the end of the broken club, and I'm just gushing blood. <laughs> and our college coach had a, had a, had a, a policy that if you broke a club, at the tournament site mm-hmm. that you were disqualified from playing the next event. So I've got to cover it up. All my teammates are in the van and they're all sitting in the back of the van. So I got to sit shotgun next to coach with, oh, my, no. with my knee just gushing blood. So I take the iron. I'm like, what am I going to do with this thing? So I take the grip handle and I shove it like down in my bag. I take the head, which still has part of the shaft sticking out and probably part of my flesh hanging on the end of the damn shaft. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what to do with this thing. So I just throw it up into the tree. And it sticks up in the tree. So we're backing out of the parking space. The club falls out of the tree, hits the hood of the van. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm in the passenger seat with a towel over my knee thinking, how am I going to hide this? So the club falls out of the tree. The coach looks, looks at me. Who else is playing a VAS one iron? <laughs> Nobody else. On the no one else course. in the world. Nobody else in the world <laughs> except Andrew McGee probably has one. And, uh, and looks at me immediately. I get out of the car. My knees gushing blood. He's like, get that fixed, and I'll see you at my office 5.30 Monday morning. Oh, no. Um, and ended up in you penalty didn't, runs. You didn't play that next event. I didn't play the next event, and I ended up running. Yeah. But it was uh, – it was. I, le- I learned in that moment, don't break golf clubs on the golf course. Break them – off the course? Off the golf course. <laughs> yeah, coming off 18, that's like the best way to, to break clubs. doesn't Absolutely. cost you anything during the Absolutely. round. The worst is when you, like, break the putter or something on the ninth hole. Then you got to play the back nine with a wedge. It's Listen, like, oh. at TrueSpec, we love folks that break clubs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, Kevin, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, we'll uh, we'll check in, you know, and see how things are going a little bit later in the year. Um, uh, obviously, I uh, think we're pretty good on most of the gear. Tune in some driver stuff. And I know uh, Andrew will join us during one of our sessions here so he can kind of take a deep dive into what we do when we work together. But thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you.